Welcome back to Supply Chain Secrets, and this week we are talking inventory management. No, I'm not talking inventory management. I've got one of my specialists, Kieran Hogan, talking about inventory management. And in fact, he gave a great presentation at a recent seminar, which we managed to video, and that's what I'm going to share this week. He's found 33 sins that people commit in inventory management, and it's coming right up. I was also really excited to find that the theme was sins, because oh, well, I had this Catholic nuns education and priests, and I reckon I could fill this 20 minutes with talking about sins full stop, because that's all we learnt for about, for a fair while anyway. But it made me think about it, they taught you things like mortal sins and venial sins and, and purgatory and heaven and hell and all this stuff, and it kind of relates a bit to this, because there's some things that if you don't do, that's really bad. If things aren't so bad, that's how it is. But so we got to think about it and I thought, well, if, um, how many sins are there? There have got to be only 10 or so. Like, and I actually looked up the commandments to see if they match, but they don't. <laughs> anyway, in about 15 minutes, I got to 31. And then after about half an hour, I got to 33. So it doesn't take long to find the sins. We'll hand this out later. And in this afternoon session, we can talk to as many of the 33 sins in inventory management as you want to talk about. We divide them into three groups that some of them are um, foundation. If you don't do these, you're in terrible trouble. The others are supportive, if you like. If you, do, if you don't do those, you're never going to get into that top 2%, but they're not sort of so critical. And then there's some visionary guidance ones as well. So it's not, you're going to, not going to write an academic textbook out of this, but if you put it up on the wall of your office and seen that you're over all those 33 things in terms of inventory, then you wouldn't be far wrong either. But in, in the... Um, Picking up the theme of threes, if you like, and um, out of the 33, I picked three things that are really important. <laughs> if you don't do those, you can't do the other 30, um, 30 things anyway, or they won't make sense. So they're kind of foundations in a way. So I'm just going to talk about those three things for the next 10, 15 minutes or so. And the first one of those is, thou shalt observe ABC classifications. I've been working in inventory pretty much my, my whole working life and in the last 10 or 12 years almost exclusively with inventory and I haven't seen any place yet where this rule doesn't apply or something close to it. So 20% of the lines that you're dealing with through your supply chain are going to account for about 80% of revenue, probably 80% of margin, it always works out that way, sometimes we work it both ways gross margin, return on equity, it doesn't matter which way you cut it, it comes down to around that you know, 20 80 rule. And I want to share an example. There's a few dodgy numbers in the example because it's a real example and I've just changed a few numbers in case anyone ever found out who the company was. <laughs> we want to hide their turnover if you like. So it works like this. You start with um, how many lines you got and these folks had um, 7,029 lines going through their warehouse in a, in a one year period and their turnover was like 51 million. What we did is we said, okay, let's have a look at the highest earner. It was about 1.1, the highest earner in that lot. And um, then we worked down the line of ever decreasing uh, um, uh, contribution to revenue until we got to the bottom. The things that accounted for the 80% of the turnover are automatically A's. The next things that account for the next 15% of turnover are B's. And you can see how the numbers are falling out here. The A's, there was just 1,125 of them, which is about 16% of lines. That's a really typical number for what we see. So that's, that's where the action is, if you like. Sometimes you even get less than that. Sometimes it'll be 9% or 10% of those lines are contributing 80% of the, of the revenue. But if you want to think about where's the goose that lays the golden egg, where's the action, where's the effort belong, it's in that number there for sure. That's your bread and butter. So the question is, will we treat them all the same? Well, if you haven't identified them, you probably are, by default, treating them all the same. And um, which ones will you put the most effort into? So if you, um, anyone got horses, dogs, racehorses, anything like that? <laughs> if you've got 
Um, 20 racehorses in your stable or something like that, and you've got some that can really run fast, then you put all the effort into those. They get the massage every morning, they get the best oats, they get everything, and you'll win some races. If you treat them all the same, you might feel good, but you're not going to win any races, that's for sure. And um, that's why you do that. The um, calculation of this, we can have a look at it um, uh, later on um, this afternoon if you want to have a look at how that works, if you want to know how to calculate those ABCs. But that's the general principle. Thing is, there, which one will we treat them all the same? Well, it depends whether you're the inventory planner or the warehouse person or the finance guy or whatever. You'll all have something to do with um, with inventory, and if you get them wrong, and this is the mortal and the venial sins part of it, if you get them wrong, the wages of sin are low turns because if you treat everything the same, your turns are inevitably lower than they would otherwise be, because. The fast-moving stuff that accounts for most of the revenue is not getting the priority. It sort of drops back to the average a bit and you get a lower average. The next one there is your warehouse cost goes up. And lately, with the cost of money being so low, often the most significant part of the inventory cost is your warehouse cost saving, you know, housing the stuff, especially in Sydney where the space is expensive. So your warehouse cost goes up and the availability goes down. Sometimes you can have reasonable availability still, but it's no better for A's than it is for C's if you treat them all the same. Here then is an example of, um, it's a real life example with a few fudged figures basically, but we looked at the first part of that um, already, the green sections there, and the next bit we've got the stock on hand. So this mob had about $9 million and they were doing about 5.6 turns. So with an industrial product as it was, it probably wasn't too bad actually, you see threes. When we measured their availability though, it was 93 what do the numbers say? 93, 94, 93. So the C's were getting this, the same amount of attention and achieving the same result as the A's. And again, this is not unusual whatsoever. And the question is, what do you want your A's to be? So with using that discriminating between A's, B's and C's, um, we projected forward and said, if you replenish the orders frequently enough, check your inventory, do all these things that you do to preference the A's, you can get 98% out of A's. But why bother with the C's? Why don't we try, aim for a low amount? Let's go for 93% on the, on the C's. And we said, projected forward and said, you can live on $6 million worth of inventory, not $9 million. So with this company, um, the, uh, the supply ch chain manager executed that plan and achieved exactly that. So she knocked 3 million bucks out of inventory uh, in 18 months or so. And um, the difference then, you want to work out what that's worth to you? Well, depends what you value your inventory at. But again, warehousing was a significant cost here. Cost of money, they established it as being the hurdle cost of money, what they could have got by putting their money elsewhere. And said, OK, let's call it 20%. So if they save just on $3 million, then it's um, around about $600,000 of real savings, uh, which goes to the bottom line, basically. So there's the argument for ABC. In, short term, in, uh, in the short version of it. Um, if you wanted to ask a question, though, back in your uh, supply chain, you could, uh, you could ask these three, or maybe one more, how many A-lines do we have? And s ask a few people. Ask the warehouse person, ask the planner, and um, ask the purchasing people. See if they all give you the same answer, for starters. <laughs> and then ask them the supplementary custom, why is it an A, if it's an A? What, what makes it an A? And see if they have got the same answer there. And then ask them about the results, what you really care about, the availability, and to Stephen's point before, the die fought by A's. <laughs> That's what you're really concerned about, because you want that 98 plus percent, essentially, in most um, wholesale retail businesses. So there's what to ask. You could ask one more, actually, that, um, and I couldn't write it up because it wasn't a multiple of three, but the real one is this, that um, uh, if you ask the warehouse guys, what do you diff do different to the A's, to, to the B's and C's, and see if that person says stock counts, stock check frequency. If you want to ask the uh, inventory uh, planner, what do you do different A's, B's and C's? Hopefully they'll say, I've got my safety stock set higher for A's than I have for C's, and, uh, and so on and so forth. So you get the picture. Second commandment, we're on to commandments, aren't we? I'm, um, I'm getting religious. Thou shalt forecast demand, because you have to do it. You, kind of, you can do it by mistake or by default, if you like, but you ought to do it proactively. And um, I just want to make a few points about, about this very thing, though. And the first one is that um, requirements planning is not demand forecasting. So often we get folks that have got an issue and they say, I think I need a, um, some forecasting. Well, you do, but you probably also need some supply chain planning. So if you've got your 
demand forecast on one line, you really need to have your inventory and your supply on the next two lines so you can see those as a whole. So um, the, the, the um, message there is that uh, think of them differently and uh, plan your business accordingly. The other one is that forecasting demand is harder than forecasting orders or filling orders, if you like. So to the extent that you can know your forward orders, <laughs> your forecasting challenge is diminished. I see a lot of businesses these days that, uh, that don't take any place, any value on forward orders in the bag, if you like, but it is so valuable and that um, just takes the weight off the forecasting task. Third one, and here's sort of an aphorism here, is that averages are dangerous, and exactly for why, um, picking up on what Mel said as well, is that um, averages don't tell you anything about trends, averages don't tell you anything about seasonality, and averages don't tell you very much about how quickly things are changing in the market these days. So, yeah, by all means have averages, and some materials, yeah, you can forecast them on averages, that's fine, but these days, more than ever, um, you need to be a bit smarter than that. Look at the um, trends, seasonality, and standard deviation. And we can talk about those things more this other, if you like. I mentioned this just now, is that the tastes are changing, things are moving quicker. So the competitive advantage is to be able to change product lines fast and effectively and, and not stuff things up on the way through, basically. So um, the other one is that human forecasting is pretty difficult, it's expensive, and it's often unreliable. <laughs> So sometimes we see a client, um, more than a few lately actually, that have said, hey, okay, I've got my field sales guys um, working on the forecasting, everything's going to be sweet now. And um, well, for all sorts of reasons that can't be true. <laughs> but the, I think the biggest concern is that it takes them a whole day to do something. They'll have a line of, you know, a Excel page of 500 things that they're expected to give a forecast to. So there'll be an afternoon of a, of a month gone already as they sort of nut their way through that. And then depending on whether it's coming up to budget time or just after budget time, they've got completely different motivations. Coming up to budget time, they don't want too much, they don't want to forecast too many sales because there's their, there's their commission <laughs> target. And then immediately after the budget is set, they just want inventory. They don't, <laughs> they don't care usually. And um, so different motivation completely. Um, and um, me being an ex-salesman, I think that's perfectly fine. That's actually not a sin, but you need to make sure that you know that sales folks are sales folks. And one size doesn't fit all, so what we normally do, and I know some um, folks from um, Netstock are here today, and um, we classify inventory a bit more simply than, a bit more complex than just ABC in a matrix, and different, in, uh, different items falling into the different parts of the matrix will get treated in different ways. We'll have different forecasting approaches for those things, and that's important as well. So if you don't, you're out of stock, you'll have out of stocks, you're going to have excess inventory, you'll end up with that nine million instead of the six. You'll get obsolescence expense. The more C's you've got, the more ex obsolescence expense you're going to get because it's there for longer, moving slower and has more time to go obsolescent, <laughs> if you like. Then you've got the hidden costs. Sometimes we try and work out the cost of lost sales and that's usually a huge number. And uh, the cost of rework, so filling back orders and doing things twice, that's it. If you add all those things up then, the competitive advantage is in being good at the forecasting because it drives all those other things, and then you can get to be the lowest cost competitor. And the absolute co lowest cost competitor can't lose. That's where you kind of want to be. Another um, topic for discussion at some time. Um, on the point of that then, then you have to think about forecasting systems versus supply chain management systems. You probably need both to some extent. In terms of what to do, try and get more orders outside of the lead time. I used to sell combine harvesters. We'd try and get all the orders for the combines at $600,000 each before the crop went in. <laughs> and that's the ideal world. And before you build any of them, because um, if they don't take them, you're, um, you're in trouble. Manage market demand, that um, shopping channels on TV is an excellent example. They've got fixed inventory then and they just turn up and down the, in, the advertising to make sure that the demand meets the stock that they've got to move. So you can do uh, that to a level. Um, we don't have time to talk about this in detail now, but happy to this afternoon. Use sell-through. Start with your target of what you're going to sell as things are released and monitor that and respond to it. Look at that order board, the coverage and work to market share. I know some folks in the room are going to have market share information available. 
We sometimes do this exercise of um, who wins, the machines or the humans. So we've got three years of data. We take the, la the first two years, project forward on the third year and compare that with what the business forecast before. And we can easily work out whether the machines are smarter than, or better than the humans at this, at this work. They almost always are, which makes things good. Uh, use sales forecasts carefully, and I just mentioned that in terms of the, uh, uh, the motivation for sales folks anyway. The other thing is for um, bigger companies, consider economic, e econometric modelling, which looks at external factors, which tells you what your market's going to do, and work out your share from there. And then have a forecasting strategy to suit the item and the market, so pick the, um, the forecasting strategy that works. And I think Stephen will be talking today about sales and operation planning or integrated business planning, so um, you need that as the baseline under your, under your business as well. And you've mentioned um, benchmarking and measurement, Stephen, so that's good. The um, next one here is that thou shalt have an inventory policy. There's a long description, it'll be in your handout somewhere anyway, so have a look at that later. The um, key thing here to know is that it can be a short one or a long one. So a one pager is often okay, and for a bigger and more complex business you need more in it. But um, if you don't have an inventory policy to work with, then you're going to get consensus, tradition, um, driving what people do in the business, and you're going to get um, reaction to the issue of the day, if you like, which is a problem because people react on the day. Anyone done the beer game here? A few? Really great fun. Try and do that if you get a chance. But it shows you what happens if you react quickly and overreact, how a little change can make a big difference if you're not careful. Um, the cause and effect are hard to pin down if you don't have an inventory policy, if you don't write down what you're going to do and something goes wrong, you're not quite sure what you actually did because there's been no rules to follow. If you don't have an inventory policy and you want to adopt a, a forecasting system or a supply chain planning system, then you can't because you need the rules to underpin that before you start. <laughs> you can't compare, as um, Stephen mentioned bef before, you want to know what your performance is. Um, you can't make those comparisons unless you've got some rules that says how you're going to do things. And you can't measure your overall success in the finish. I think the most important parts of this, though, is the ABCs, how they calculate, and how are you going to apply those? What are you going to do with them? And then in that, also you'd have the next most important thing in my view is what the service level objective is. So if we know that we want these to be A's, we're going to manage them a certain way, what are we going to deliver? What level of performance are we going to deliver with those A's? Then we need to know which ones are going to be stock, which ones are going to be indent or um, supply to order, if you like. And which ones are going to be direct ship, if you like? Because if you don't have it written down, you end up with a little bit of everything going everywhere and there's no fixed rule there either. And of course, work out which warehouse gets what. Probably all the warehouses get the A's, but maybe you just want to centralise your C's in one warehouse. That's a huge potential saving um, in that respect. And then finally, the, 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 once you start to work through that stuff, how are we going to forecast? Are we going to use advanced algorithms, we're going to do something simple, basically as simple as a max min all the way through, what, triple exponential smoothing, I think, or something like that, <laughs> is that you'll work out. So that's the, um, that's the thing there. So the, um, I've got two minutes. I've been good, because there was a 34th sin, I think, and that was going over time, so I'll be good here. But um, the 33 around that, the, the prayer wheel, and have a look at that this afternoon if you come to my session, because we can pick any some or all of those things to talk about and get into a bit more depth on. So thank you, everyone. So thank you for joining us again this week. We really appreciate you giving up your time. We also appreciate getting your comments and feedback. So do please comment below. Ask any questions you like. Uh, if there's topics that you'd like in the future, let us know because that's how we can understand what you'd like to watch. And we actually start making our videos that way. So, uh, you know how it works. Our videos come out generally on a Wednesday. If you want to be notified about those, do hit the subscribe button. If you hit that bell, you'll get an automatic notification. Uh, and if you've enjoyed this channel, do share the channel, invite your friends. The more the merrier, the more questions we get, the more motivation we get to make more videos on supply chain and logistics. So thanks for dropping in and we'll see you next week.